Radio Surgery for Lung Cancer. This is one of a series that can be found on the website aboutcancer.com of cancer videos directed to issues related to various types of cancer. This is on the use of highly targeted radiation, or what would be called SBRT or SABR, for early stage non-small cell carcinoma of the lung. Only about 16% of lung cancer patients present as an early stage, and the survival even in this group is poor, 55% in the national data. Part of the problem is the patients often are ill, they have underlying lung disease, patients tend to be older, the median age is 70. According to the current NCCN treatment guidelines, and as I dictate this in February of 2017, the current guidelines are version 4.2017. But in these guidelines for a patient with an early lesion, the standard recommended treatment is surgery, a lobectomy with a node dissection. But if the patient's medically inoperable, they do recommend definitive radiation, including SBRT or SABR. And for patients with T2 lesions, as long as the lymph nodes are negative, if they are not surgical candidates, the guidelines for lymph node negative include SBRT or SABR. Again, if you look at survival curves for stage one, they're not very good, 51% in another national trial. And then if you look at the surgical staging, if the clinical stage one patient, the five-year survival, 50 to 43% clinical means based on x-ray findings. The pathologic survival for stage one is better as noted, but this is because they've eliminated people who were found to have lymph nodes involved. And I would point out that most of the survival comparisons with radiation should be compared to clinical stage one. If you look at overall radiation for inoperable stage one lung cancer, the five-year survival rate is poor. If you look at SBRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy, which is highly targeted radiation, where the treatment can now be given in just a few number of dose fractions, usually one to five. The ASTRO has defined SBRT as using very large doses per fraction. And the technique requires detailed targeting, immobilization, accounting for motion and movement. And it may be necessary to do special procedures to get the motion of the lung tumor under control. The idea is to have the radiation conformal, which means targeted directly around the tumor. And if you compare targeted radiation with more conventional radiation, you can see in the diagram with conventional radiation basically came in one side and went out the other. If you can do highly targeted radiation with small number of fractions, the primary tumor control, as you note here from the RTOG 061A trial, is very high. And again, the idea is if you give small fractions of a large dose, you have a larger biologic effect. So the conventional dose, 30 treatments of two gray, uh, calculates to a BED biologic dose in the 70s and 80s. If you give three or five fractions of a much larger dose, the BED or biologic equivalent dose is much higher, well over 100. And as I'll point out, you need to get over 100 to get the real benefits of SBRT. We often treat these patients with a machine called tomotherapy. Tomotherapy is basically a hybrid machine where a linear accelerator is built inside a spiral CT. Here's a typical patient treated with SBRT on a tomotherapy. A small adenocarcinoma in the left lung. You can see the PET scan, it lights up. The radiation plan was highly targeted on that small area, and the PET scan a year later shows nothing in that area. Another patient with a small squamous cancer in the left upper lobe. You can see the small lesion on the PET scan. You can see the radiation target from the TOMO, and you can see eight months later, as all the PET scan shows, is some scar tissue or fibrous tissue at that site. The technique is similar to this. We use the CAT scan and PET scan images to develop a target called the GTV or gross tumor volume. Then you use multiple images to account for movement and create a larger target called the internal target volume or ITV. Then you ask the computer to add a margin around this target or expand the target usually by five millimeters. And this is called the PTV, the planning target volume. 
and you want this as small as possible and again you can rotate the images around and look at this in any dimension and then you add in the other organs to measure the dose of radiation to normal structures and the computer will track the dose to these other normal structures to ensure they are protected from too high of a dose of radiation. So here's in fact this actual patient, an 80 year, man, 80 year old man with a small adenocarcinoma in the left upper lobe. Because it was somewhat close to the mediastine, we used the lower dose, 10 gray times five. You can see the PET scan before, it's bright yellow. You can see the SBRT target, and you can see the PET scan two months later. There's just a little scar tissue left at the site of the tumor. We also use the cyber knife, which is ideal for this treatment. The cyber knife can really account for lung motion. With the cyber knife, it's often necessary, however, to place a fiducia or a little metal clip. And there was some risk of complications from placing that. On the panels on the left, the needle has gone into the tumor and there's an air leak or a pneumothorax and part of the lung collapses. On the images on the right with a needle uh, inserted into a tumor, you can see some bleeding into the lung afterwards. Nevertheless, the cyber knife is ideal for radiosurgery. Here's a typical cyber knife case. You can see on the PET scan, the bright yellow spot in the right lung. And two months later on the PET scan is all you see is the clip where the tumor was before. And so the question is, are the results with SBRT or SABR uh, better than conventional radiation? And in fact, have they gotten so good, they're as good as conventional surgery. So several questions. One, is it better than nothing? I think there is evidence of that. Two, it's better than conventional radiation or so-called 3D conformal. Three, it's probably as good if not better than wedge resections or sub-lobar resections, which means people who were too ill to have a standard lobectomy. Four, it's probably better than risking surgery in a high-risk patient, someone who's old, or has poor medical status. And finally, it may actually be as good as a standard lobectomy. A typical study would be this paper from Denmark, where they looked at 147 patients treated with SBRT and they compared them through the tumor registry with untreated patients who were similar. And you can see the survival was dramatically better, 40 months versus nine months. So offering the patient SBRT is probably better than doing nothing. Step two, is it better than conventional standard radiation? And you can see from this data collection, the local control is much higher with SBRT in the 97% range. And the overall survival is substantially better as well, probably doubles. And there is evidence that improving local control will, develop, will correlate with better overall survival. And there are more studies now since we've been doing this since basically the turn of the century that there are now long-term survivals, uh, five or six, seven years uh, that you can find in the literature using SBRT. The RTOG or the Radiation Therapy Oncology Study Group is done for trials on this topic. In the 0236 trial, they used 18 gray times three and had excellent local control, 93%, good survival and low side effects. And here's the survival curve. In the 061A trial, they raised the dose a little 20 gray times three for operable cases. And again, very high local control rate in the 92% range, good overall survival, low toxicity. They did another study, 0915, and said you can even do this in one treatment, 34 gray times one, and have good control here, 97% with low side effects. And there are other studies showing uh, long survival as noted from this CyberKnife paper. There's also evidence that uh, this may be better than a wedge resection. This paper from Grills, published in 2010, if you look at the comparisons, the local regional control with SBRT was better than doing a wedge resection. And the overall survival was basically the same. And another paper, this from Welsh, was looking at patients who had lobectomy, wedge resection, or SBRT, and you can see the overall survival was similar. This led to then two trials to try to compare SBRT with a lobectomy, the STARS trial and the Roselle trial. There weren't enough patients put in the study to complete them, but Chang combined the data and published a study in Lancet Oncology 
And if you look, the overall survival with SBRT looks as good, if not better, than the lobectomy. And the overall toxicity was much lower in SBRT than in lobectomy. There are multiple studies now on treating patients who are older. This, page, this series here, 175 people over 75. The overall survivor rates were good. The short-term and long-term side effects were quite low. Finally, there was a recent paper from the Veterans Affairs System. They're using more SBRT in the VA system. And as noted here, the overall survival is much better than their conventional radiation. Some of the early trials on doses, most of the trials were limited to people with lesions um, small than four centimeters, but a recent paper from the Cleveland Clinic with the tumors even larger than four centimeters, up to seven, showed good local control with low toxicity. The NCCN does have guidelines for the dose based on the size and location of the tumor. Most patients are treated in our centers with three times 18 or 20 gray for the small tumors that are away from the center or the ribs, and then five times 10 gray for tumors that are too close to the center or near the ribs or the chest wall. And we've had good results with both of these protocols with very low toxicity. So what are the side effects and toxicity of SBRT? Again, some of the early dose trials back in 2005 started out eight gray times three and slowly increased the dose. Timmerman published a paper in 2006 that said if the tumor is too close to the center, there's more toxicity. And he generated what he called a no-fly zone, an area that needed to be avoided if the tumor was too central. The RTOG then did a trial, the 0813, looking at central tumors to try to determine a safe dose. And they published preliminary abstract information and other, other centers, this paper from MD Anderson, they slowed the dose down to seven to 10 fractions and found they could get good local control with, with minimal toxicity. And so the collected data now says that even for central lesions, as long as you use a safe dose, the local control rate can be, still be very high. And in order to do this safely, the radiation oncologist will mark in or contour all the important structures the RTOG has an atlas for how to identify all these structures. They're called organs at risk, and these can be uh, generated. And here's images to show these structures. And then there are published dose guidelines. The NCC ha has these and many other sources. How safe is it uh, to treat an area over the spinal cord or the ribs or the stomach or esophagus? How much is safe? And there's similar guidelines and dose limits or dose constraints from the stable mates trial. As long as these are followed, the risk of side effects is quite small. When we first started doing this uh, near the chest wall, there were rib fractures, 23% in some of the earlier trials. Now that the dose has been identified, the risk of rib fracture should be down around 3% or less than 5%. So the main side effect is actually now more pulmonary. Here's a typical patient, an 80 year old with a 2.7 centimeter cancer. You can see the radiation in the picture on the left. Four months later, there's just an area of reaction or fibrosis in the lung. If you look at the PET scan through that area, it does not light up. So we thought this was just benign scar tissue or fibrosis. And at 12 months, the area of scar tissue was continuing to shrink and fade away. And this patient did fine without any symptoms at all as far as toxicity. They're trying again to have a randomized trial to compare in high-risk patients, either limited surgery or SBRT. They define high risk as people with poor pulmonary function or people who are older with poor pulmonary function. The NCCN guidelines is published, as I say, February 2017. They come up with several conclusions about this. One, they think SBRT has primary control rates and survival that compare to lobectomy and are definitely higher or better than 3D or conventional. They think in non-randomized trials, SBRT is an option if the patients cannot under tolerate a lobectomy and are definitely comparable to a wedge resection, and I think probably better. Number three, in partially completed randomized trials that we've discussed, the outcome are similar to that with a lobectomy and definitely with lower toxicity. 
that in order for this to be effective, intensive regimens, which means a BED, biologic dose, over 100 is necessary. For central lesions, it's necessary to limit the size of each fraction, and rather three treatments, the radiation should be given in four to 10 fractions. And they interpreted the RTOG0813 trial to say that 10 gray times five appears to be safe, and that's what we've been using. And that most commonly, the limits have been up to five centimeters, but larger lesions can be treated safely if the dose constraints are met. And finally, if you look at survival data that was used in the StableMate trial, the collected data for SBRT for these stage one cancers, 76 up to 95% appears to be as good as not, if not better than the available data on surgical patients as noted on this table. Finally, more information can be found about radiosurgery for lung cancer on the website aboutcancer.com.